Good morning. This uh, presentation is from Mr. Andy Rayner, who is with Nevion, now part of uh, Sony, I guess a Sony group company now. Okay. And um, Andy's going to be talking with us today about distributed production and use cases, uh, particularly federation between uh, different sites. So take it away, Andy. Thank you, Wes. Good to see you, the, uh, the few faithful on this uh, one of these early sessions. Being the morning after the evening of, of some sad news, I'm just going to take an indulgence for 10 seconds to give my tribute to Her Majesty the Queen. This is the only picture I have of me and her. So I was, I was 10 years old and looking with admiration, as you can see there. So um, anyway, just a, a moment of reflection before I jump into my, my tech talk. Okay, so a few... Um, overall thoughts about what broadcasters and content producers actually are looking to achieve. And there are two fundamentals that I see all the time. One is in an attempt to increase production value. And the other, which is always there, is an attempt to, to decrease the cost. So, and along with those is flexibility. And it's that flexibility piece along with the, those other bits that actually I think what I'm going to be talking about today really plays into. In addition to that, high availability is incredibly important for broadcast, and that actually plays into some of the other things we're going to be thinking about a bit later on in terms of resilience. This is my go-to picture, which I've been using in every presentation for the last uh, two years, I think, looking at just the elements of, of connectivity. So what we have moved from is, is having a, an insular OB truck or an insular um, production facility to actually having many elements of the production, both the technology and the people distributed over a large area. The, the, the kind of cue here in terms of the coloring is the dark blue is acquisition and, and, and visualization devices, the orange is control, and the um, light blue is the processing slash storage. So this shows kind of some of those elements coming together in the different strands that, that, that are needed to make an end-to-end -end production. And just going to visualize those IP benefits before we're getting to looking at the technology itself. The, the, the key thing about the IP transformation in terms of IP production is, is not the fact that we've replaced SDI cables with pieces of 10 gig fiber because that in itself is barely arguably a cost saving, probably not. But as soon as we actually start moving to this interconnected distributed architecture where the people, people can be in different locations, the equipment, the processing resource can be in different locations and the real estate can be in different locations, then suddenly we actually have some real um, flexibility and cost saving that's, that's, that's visible. And this is just another way of vi visualizing it. We, we've been calling it in some new work with the three P's, the places, the processing and the people. And it's the, it's the way we actually are able to share those and utilize them in their best positions is, is, the, um, is, the, is the true benefit that we're seeing here. So thinking about this journey to flexibility in IP that we've had. So we've had you know, IP wide area infrastructure, that's something which we've been doing for 25 years probably. And we've done lots of techniques which have kind of gradually come into IP facility like the, the resilience architectures that we've used, um, especially in the RTP layer um, for wide area networking, which we've pulled into. So the IP facility infrastructure gave us um, the you know, the, the, the ubiquity um, of, the, of the transport technology that's not locked to specific standards. So we can have any of those flexibility and standards. Then we've got to this complete IP end-to-end -end we're talking about, which is where that distributed production really starts to actually be, be beneficial. And then very finally, the end game, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, is, is, is everything completely virtualized. So, so we've actually got new ways of actually running things. I think we've probably talked about this in, 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 the, in the code that I've gone through already and I've shown you this picture. So we'll jump straight into the distributed production. And one of the specific things that I'm looking at here is the elements of what we do in the control plane. So very 
usually we have a control system for a production facility. And we've been doing those to extreme scale and providing those technologies from within, from within Nevion. Um, but what we are seeing the need for more and more as we do distributed production is the, there's two almost conflicting requirements we see. First of all, each, each entity or facility, be that a single OB truck or be that a large IP production facility, each of those facilities wants security resilience and autonomy in their own right within their control system. So it needs to be secure, and it needs to be autonomous and resilient. Um, yet, what we want to do is to have the almost plug and play flexibility to share resources between different locations. Um, so we, we, we need the ability to what we are calling federating um, the control layer between locations. Now, I'm gonna share with you some use cases of how we've done that with our, with our technology that stands today, and I'm also going to unpack the the standards work, which is just just concluded. That's actually enabling us to do that in in a standards and interoperable way. So you've probably seen these um, what the DPP called remote production models. Um, I was privileged to be part of the of the brainstorming that came up with these these um, these models and we've added some ad, added a couple ourselves here and really these are just using those color coding that I outlined earlier the different kind of scenarios of where those control surfaces the storage and processing and the acquisition and playback devices are actually located in the infrastructure and this again gives light to the flexibility that we're actually offered now with an interconnected wide area IP capability. So you're very, very familiar with the 2110 standard, the, the suite. I'm not going to go through any of these. This is not a tutorial on 2110. There are, there are several things that, are, that have come to be useful within here, but a couple of things to point out that which we're going to refer to later. First of all, the compressed video, um, the dash 22 on the, on the second line down on the left, that becomes important because um, bandwidth is more um, precious in a wide area environment, generally in a local area production facility, it's not so much of an issue. We also have the control plane at the bottom and, and in the work we've been doing to standardize the way we interconnect distributed facilities, the control plane has actually been the, the largest challenge that we've actually been looking at overcoming. So I think I've outlined these requirements already. The, 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 each location needs to have autonomy, it needs to have resilience, and it needs to have full sharing with other locations. So what I'm gonna do now is unpack some of the use cases. Uh, there's four of them, which we've been working on in recent times, um, that have actually all been looking to do federation and distributed production architectures, but in slightly different ways. So first of all, un unpacking this system. So this is a a large European-based infrastructure for a, for a customer. Many, many locations across many countries, but basically the, the aim was to actually have all of that processing. So if you remember the three Ps, all of the processing infrastructure in two good resilient data centers. And the concept is then that each, each user in any of those countries is actually able to make use of the resources, the processing resources that are available within those two data centers. What we want within those data centers, um, you've, you've seen it coming, I can tell, is we, we need each of those da data centers needs to be resilient and autonomous, um, yet it needs to actually be able to negotiate resource sharing with the other data center. So that's where the federation comes into this particular scenario. So you've got a complete distributed production architecture, very lightweight infrastructure in each of the production environments in the countries because it's basically just the front end, in, front end equipment. Everything else is located in the data centers. So we've got that distribution, but we've also got this federation between the two good data centers, which in this case happen to be very local to where we are here in, in the Netherlands and in the UK. So that's, that's case study number one, and this just breaks it down a little bit more, um, just to show you, so we, those two data centers on this diagram are called the two hubs, and you can see the concept of that standard spatial diversity for the interconnect to each of the countries, along with the infrastructure that exists 
in each of those um, data centers. Case study two is, an, is, a, is a, 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 a different spin. So this is a, another European country where we deployed initially IP facility, so initially standalone IP facility. Um, and then the, the customer wanted and needed to connect different IP facilities together um, in, a, in a distributed manner to be able to do the resource sharing that we've been talking about and to have the flexibility. So, so we, we looked about taking from individual IP facilities and actually merging them together in, in, a, in a virtual connection. And this is a very complicated diagram. I can't expect you to see it. I certainly can't see it on my preview screen here. But this shows the, just, just the scale of the interconnection of those different facilities. And one of the interesting options there is within um, an architecture where you're interconnecting facilities, you can either go for a peer-to-peer -peer arrangement where each of the control systems, each of those autonomous and resilient control systems in each location um, is actually peer-to-peer -peer communicating with the other control systems in the other locations, or you can go for a hierarchical approach where you have a control system, an orchestration system, a layer that's sitting above that. So each of the systems talks to um, you know, an overarching control system that actually is doing the federation between elements. And that really depends on probably the architecture of the, the structure, the commercial structure and the, and the way it's being done. In some cases, when you have a service provider that's providing that, then that overarching orchestration tool may actually be very effective. So that's the second point, second delivery that we've been looking at there. Um, this next one is, is a more recent one, and, and this is actually an interesting play um, on the concept of federation, because so far, everything I've outlined, I've been talking about, if you like, geographical diversity and looking to reconcile and control facilities in different locations and share resources between locations. This specific um, use case here, uh, which is a relatively recent one, you, you, you remember those, those things I talked about on the left-hand side there, the autonomy, the resilience, yet the sharing. The, the concept here is, is actually that within a large facility, divide and conquer. So actually create a, a standalone control um, capability for the studios and control rooms, maybe all of them, or even sub 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 subsets subsets of studios and control rooms um, separate control system for play out and separate orchestration for for the MCR system and what that actually gives you again is more resilience so you you haven't got control system dependency that's spanning multiple parts of the business so so this is what I call an intra facility federation rather than an inter-facility federation, because what you're actually doing is you're splitting up, a, albeit a large facility, into different zones, if you like, and you have that autonomy and resilience with, with the clustering of the control systems in each of those locations, and then you're actually allowing those systems to communicate with each other in a, in a plug-and-play manner. There's another scenario, another use case, um, which is, is again is a very recent one, where the concept is here, what you're doing with Federation is actually doing multi-organization interconnect. So if you think about the concept where you've actually got multiple productions happening, and if you're doing a remote production, a distributed production architecture, so you've got different production companies that could come in and actually do the production for different events. So you've actually got a number of events, you've got a number of production companies that you're looking to actually engage to work with you or to enhance your capability for doing production. And you're actually able to actually federate all of those different elements um, into and out of those different production companies. So it's a, it's a, yet a, this is a wide area example, but it's a different concept in terms of what you're actually looking to do. And, and just sh showing this in a different way, um, going back to that DPP model, you'll see we've got that kind of what we would originally call the centralized model where acquisition is in one location and the storage processing and control is in one location. But now we're actually saying we're actually distributing 
that production into 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 multiple locations. So a lot of flexibility there. In terms of the principles we're actually using um, in Federation, I guess I've alluded to those already, but typically a control system um, in a critical production facility needs to be resilient in its own right. So typically the way we would achieve that is to have multiple nodes that, that are actually effectively instantiated as a cluster. So they're actually providing capability um, as a clustered compute architecture. And the way what happens as we federate is those clusters of, of, of capability actually arbitrate through secure APIs with the APIs on the other clusters with all of the requisite authentication and other secure mechanisms. So the, this is the, um, a, another spin or another view, if you like, visualization of one of my earlier diagrams where we're actually looking at those different locations. You see we've also got at the bottom right there the, the at-home control as well because as, as was highlighted by COVID, there is more and more potential for that lo operation location given, given reasonable connectivity to be in, in, in different locations. And this again shows you the concept of the, the clusters of control architecture in those different elements. And one thing to draw your attention to on this picture is the concept which we've actually done, done in, in, in the real world now in deployments of actually having cloud-based control architecture for cloud-based infrastructure um, federated with control, you know, st classic control infrastructure um, in a clustered architecture for ground-based infrastructure. So you know, actually federating between cloud infrastructure and ground infrastructure. So there's a kind of a whistle-stop tour of some of the concepts and some of the deployments that we've been doing in recent times. What I'd like to do just um, as I as I come to a, a, a close shortly is, to, is go through some of the standards work which we've been doing on this in the last two and a half or so years. Um, this work has just about wrapped up. The, the final documents have been finished. It hasn't gone to publication. I was hoping we were going to get it through the door for IBC, but it hasn't actually made that yet. But we have actually completed the work. And what you can see here is what I call the data plane and the control plane. So the data plane is the the actual media flows themselves. Um, so we're actually taking them through. And as, as you'll be aware of, as we go through um, out of a facility into a wide area network and then back into a facility, we need to do things to that data plane traffic. We need to potentially compress it if, it's, if we've got lower bandwidth. We, we probably need to address translate it because the IP, the IP address scheme in one facility is not going to be the same as the other. We, we possibly need to um, do some error protection to provide additional resilience, as well as maybe doing RTP diversity a la 2022-7. Um, so that's happening in the data plane, and there is a toolkit which we've defined in the standards that, that actually pertains to that. And then, as I alluded to earlier, the, con the, the, the tougher part of this was how we do the control plane, because what we want to do is we want to offer those resources from one facility to another. It needs to be done in a secure way um, and it needs to be done in a, in a controlled manner. And what we've actually ended up working, working with or defining is what I call a constrained subset of some of the NMOS tools. I won't go into the details now, but one more diagram just to show you a little bit here. We actually have what we call NMOS proxying. So we've tried to make this architecture so you don't have to be using NMOS within the facilities, although obviously we would hope that you would be, um, but it does allow us to actually proxy the resources that are available in a facility, make them available in the, in the, the DMZ, if you like, that is the control, the, the, the wide area network, and then subsume them back into the other facility. And it goes without saying that the control plane needs to be have the appropriate natting of all of the information that's relevant in the control plane to the address translation, et cetera, that you're doing to the flows in the data plane. So that's kind of a, a given in the way we do this. Okay, so that wraps up my brief whistle-stop tour of distributed production. So we've looked at four different use cases with different topologies, some 
wide area um, and some actually doing federation within a facility. We've looked about how, how the standard interconnect and standard handoff in the future is going to be done using this 2110 over 1 um, work that's actually being realised from the VSF as TR09 parts 1 and 2. <coughs> and yeah, the, the future is absolutely in more and more flexible flexibility in distributed deduction with those three P's, the people, the places, and the processing, how we can actually use them to maximum efficiency <coughs> and to give us the most flexible production environment. Just as I draw a quick plug, I'm actually going to be back here in an hour and a half um, today to talk about linear and non-linear timing planes in IP production how we are moving from a linear world to a non-linear world and how that impacts the way we think about timing in infrastructure. Also, a plug for another one I'm doing on Monday morning, which is on audio in live IP production. So my final slide, as always, is an invitation to join me for a cup of tea. I'm pleased to say that the stand we're on, the Sony stand, actually, for the first time, is doing cups of tea. So I can make you a nice cup of tea on the Sony stand if you'd like to come and see me. Or if you're ever in the UK, um, do shout me out on my email or my cell number. I'd love to uh, invite you over for a cup of tea. Thank you very much. Any questions? Second, what's the main benefits for intra-organization <coughs> federation? Intra, inside. So intra. So the main, the main, the main benefit for doing that one is scalability, and one is resilience. Those, those are the two main benefits. So scalability, obviously, any system has some some scalable scale scale limitations. Um, although we have done, I mean, we were talking yesterday in our pre-event about show, um, about a system which has got about 150,000 connections, so simultaneously, which is very, very significant. Um, and that's in effectively, if you like, in a single system. But scaling is easier to achieve if you can divide and conquer. And the, and the second thing is resilient. So if you, if you want to do... Um, if you want to do system work, um, it's much easier to actually have segregation. So your 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 MCR system is separate for your production production playout system from your studios and gallery systems. So, so it's a those those are the the two key areas. It is it's the resilience and the autonomy that you give those locations or those sub areas, along with the potential scalability. Those would be the two key things. Well, thank you, Ren. Thank you very much.